Hello students, welcome to my lecture on globalization. Today we are going to discuss uh, the deficits or discontents as seen by critics of globalization. Uh, as you already know that uh, globalization is a phenomenon which has been with us for the last uh, almost three decades. Uh, in fact, uh, so it has generated a lot of debate uh, in these last uh, three decades among scholars and writers and experts on international relations in particular as to whether it is good or it is bad. Uh, of course, a, a, a straight answer is difficult to give because uh, it has benefits and it also has deficits and disadvantages. And today we are going to, uh, in fact, focus on that. That is in the second aspect, that what the critics have to say. In fact, uh, according to these critics, the globalization has set a dangerous and potentially uncontrollable array of forces which actually uh, are not uh, or cannot be controlled by national governments. In fact, uh, as a result of it, they argue, uh, communities have been disempowered uh, with destabilization of the nation state's uh, inherent power and authority to order its domestic economic and political arrangements and to protect established national identities. In other words, the nation state is no longer fully sovereign to control its own affairs. Now, this is an issue that I'm going to discuss in a separate lecture uh, later. But today, uh, for the moment, let me concentrate on how the critics of globalization sees its discontents or deficits. Now, of course, you know, I mean, the supporters of globalization have claimed that uh, particularly economic globalization has uh, been beneficial because uh, it has dismantled physical and other barriers to trade. But the critics of globalization uh, suggest that this dismantling of barriers have taken place at the behest of powerful trading nations and at the expense of weaker developing nations, which of course has far-reaching implications for political and economic relations between and among countries. Now, today's these critics, I mean, let me now follow the arguments advanced by the critics of globalization. Now, these critics argue that today's globalization is driven primarily by the doctrine of free market capitalism. Now, now there is, I'm sure you are all aware of the fact that there are, uh, in fact, there is a, 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 a debate uh, in political science uh, about uh, various types of uh, economic and social system and uh, free market capitalism of course is one of them uh, but there are there are there are those who argue that it is a good thing but there are also those who argue that it is not necessarily a good thing and particularly for poor or developing countries it can be very damaging now the principal instruments of this free market capitalism have been the multinational corporations and you are all aware of what they are. These are companies, large companies which are based in a particular country but which has operations throughout the world. Apart from that, of course, there is the World Bank, there is the International Monetary Fund and there is the World Trade Organizations. And uh, the critics argue that uh, this uh, process uh, of free market capitalism actually is driven by these uh, organizations. Now, they uh, pile up pressure on developing countries to open up their economies uh, so that the, the, the marketing of goods and services of developed capitalist countries can take place freely. Now, of course, you know, I mean, why should the developing countries do that? Now, the developing countries, of course, you know, they have a need for, need to generate resources for their development 
and for the for the for the eradication of poverty i mean they just do not have that kind of resources uh, within their own domestic economy so they need actually these resources from external sources now uh, of course uh, as a result the developing countries they are obliged to look to external sources and uh, uh, you know they also look to the world bank and the international monetary fund for loans and grants to meet these domestic uh, resource crunch now so therefore you know the developing countries actually you know i mean their dependence on external assistance is very clear but actually these external assistance this external assistance does not come without any conditionalities particularly if you know i mean uh, the world bank and the international monetary fund grant loans and uh, and uh, and uh, and other kinds of financial assistance actually they come with conditionalities you know i mean and 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 some, some of them actually are very stringent uh, like for instance sweeping structural changes uh, which are known as the acp structural adjustment program which actually basically means opening up of their markets to goods and services of the developed countries there are of course other uh, uh, features negative features of this particular uh, process that i have been describing uh, particularly the dependence of uh, developed countries for the spread of technology so it's not only capital but also technology from advanced countries now uh, and again these uh, technologies also come with a string you know uh, with conditionalities as as i said now you, we normally find that uh, you know i mean uh, as a as a consequence of this uh, spread of advanced technology you know media uh, particularly has has become very uh, much more easily accessible uh, which is uh, something that actually i have uh, discussed earlier and uh, in fact uh, uh, these media you know i mean the international particularly the international media i'm talking about both electronic and print media they are heavily controlled by uh, the developed countries um, now naturally you know i mean these uh, uh, under these conditions you know i mean uh, the standardized products of uh, the multinational uh, countries uh, are particularly advertised uh through the media which are actually marketed in the uh, developing countries um under the pressure of uh western popular culture now, this is something that i will come back to a little later now so therefore uh, the critics argue and i continue their argument that the benefits of today's globalization are accruing primarily to the developed economies in other words that it is the developed economies that is the advanced countries industrialized countries they uh, derive most of the benefits of today's globalization now what happens is that you know i mean their economies are producing goods and services which actually are far in excess of their own demand so what happens is that actually they need other markets now such outlets are provided were provided by colonies during the colonial era now those of you actually who are uh, good students of history will remember that uh, uh, european colonialism uh, particularly thrived on this uh, uh, this principle that is uh, the colonies actually served as sources of uh, raw material as well as markets now of course uh, the colonies no longer exist you know but uh, in a way actually shades of colonialism have come back in the sense that uh, the developing countries today provide you know i mean this kind of uh, this kind of service in the sense of uh, raw materials sending raw materials and of course uh, acting as markets for the developing countries and um, as a result of this of course you know i mean uh, in fact what happens is that sometimes you know not sometimes actually in many respects you have marketing of goods and services 
uh, which come primarily from the developed countries, uh, within the developing countries, which are not necessarily always preferred or beneficial to these countries. That is, in other words, what I'm ex what I'm explaining. For instance, I mean, if you take the example of country A, the country A is a developing country, and country A has to depend on country B, which is a developed country. Now, what happens is that you know, I mean, many of the goods and services that come from country B to country A, actually, the country A probably has uh, is not really really benefited uh, from this kind of uh, uh, marketing of goods and services, but Willy nilly, they have to. They have to do it because there is uh, clever manipulation on the on the part of the the rich countries. And apart from that, you know, I mean, the the media plays a very important role. For instance, you know, I mean, by 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 way of adverta advertisements and other kinds of campaigns to show that these goods actually and these products are are very attractive and very glamorous and so on and so forth. And of course. Uh, the foreign direct investment, you know, on which uh, the developing countries are, uh, in many respects, uh, very largely dependent, and I have already exp explained why that is so, because they do not uh, manage to generate sufficient resources of their own. Uh, now, what happens is that, you know, uh, uh, very often uh, these uh, investments actually do not go to areas where they are mostly needed. You know, because what happens is that, after all, you know, these investments actually are made by the, as I mentioned earlier, multinational corporations. Now, multinational corporations obviously are in business to uh, to maximize their profits. So, obviously, you know, they will actually invest in areas where they find that they are going to reap the maximum possible profit. Now, those areas may not necessarily be the areas which will actually benefit the particular country concerned. You know, I mean, so I'm, I'm sure uh, there is no need for me to give, into, give any specific examples. You understand, basically, it's a very simple point that I'm making. I'm sure you understand the basic point that I'm making here. Uh, as a consequence, actually, you know, I mean, you have the survival of domestic industries uh, become very much at stake. Uh, because what happens is that, you know, some of these uh, um, products which are coming from outside, from the rich countries, they actually have um, benefits, as I said, the benefits of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, new types, uh, new classes, uh, they are more glamorous, and, and so on and so forth. And particularly, I'm talking about uh, the huge retail uh, traders coming from the West, actually, you know, I mean, and our, uh, you know, domestic in, develop, in developing countries, uh, you know, small retailers, they are not able to compete with these, these huge retailers. I, I'm not going to mention any particular name, but I'm sure you can understand what I am talking about. So, therefore, the framework of today's globalization is free market, privatization, monetarism, now, I don't know whether you understand what is monetarism. Monetarism essentially means, actually, is a theory of money supply and control of interest rates. You know, I mean, this monetarism, actually, they argue, this theory argues that, you know, I mean, the, the, the principal instrument of uh, controlling an economy uh, is, of course, by uh, controlling the money supply and, of course, keeping a control on interest rates. Now, this is a very important instrument, you know, in the hands of uh, economic uh, policymakers. Then you also have business nationalism. Now, what is meant by business nationalism? It is basically promotion of businesses of economic and politically powerful countries. Now, this is something that uh, these countries resort to very often. What happens is that, you know, a particular uh, uh, business which is located in a, uh, in a rich, advanced country, you know, I mean, it probably is uh, operating in a developing country. Now, what happens is that, of course, you know, I mean, normally you would expect that this is a private affair, you know, so far as the, the, the business uh, concerned is concerned. Uh, the, the parent country should not have anything to do with it. But what happens is that the willy-nilly the parent country actually resorts to means and efforts whereby uh, it actually uh, helps 
uh, in the promotion of the product of that particular uh, business. Uh, this is uh, business nationalism. So the basic character of, again, I'm following the argument of the critics. These are not necessarily my arguments. Um, so the basic character uh, of today's globalization is coercive, that is, uh, you know, uh, resorting to force, uh, exploitative, and domination-oriented. In fact, uh, it means an effort of few uh, centers of economic and technological power to mold the world economy to their advantage. Now, objective is, as I mentioned earlier, that maximization of profit, capturing of uh, the markets of the developing countries, and of course, uh, establishing some kind of a monopoly control. Now, as I explained earlier, that uh, in the process, what, ha what is happening is that the, that the domestic uh, local industries and businesses, they are facing extinction. They are facing extinction, they are facing destruction, and uh, their own, I mean, survival actually is, is very much at stake. In fact, uh, if a detailed uh, survey is carried out, which has been carried out in, in many countries uh, by many uh, uh, researchers, that as a result of uh, the domination of the rich countries, uh, many local businesses actually have simply gone bust. I mean, they have, uh, and, and, and this of course is widening the gap between the rich and the poor inside and between societies. In fact, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and uh, as a result, uh, an, a world economic and free market system is being created, uh, where, of course, only the fittest are able to survive. So today's globalization is typically associated with a particular style of uh, uh, existence, a particular style of living, you know, I mean, uh, which is uh, the popular Western brand of uh, living, Western brand of uh, style. Uh, this is something that the developing countries must accept to grow and fight poverty effectively. This is what we are told constantly. However, the conditions of the poor in the developing countries in general have not improved much despite embracing the forces of globalization. Now, as we have already noticed that uh, the developed West particularly have succeeded in forcing the poor countries to remove their trade barriers while retaining their own uh, restrictive regimes and deprive poor countries from export income. I mean, this is another uh, glaring inequality that you find actually in today's process of globalization, you know, because what happens is that the World Trade Organization particularly, you know, which normally acts as a, as a guardian of world trade, you know, I mean, they are, uh, this particular organization is controlled uh, along with the uh, IMF and the World Bank by the, by the powerful Western countries. And so what happens is that, you know, while the developing countries are, are compelled to remove trade barriers, the developed countries, they retain their trade barriers. You know, particularly, uh, uh, they in fact resort to subsidies uh, uh, on, on, on textiles, uh, on sugar, uh, on agriculture, and so on and so forth. But these subsidies uh, given by the developing countries actually are forced to be, to be removed. And then with the Western banks, they also benefit from the relaxation of capital uh, market uh, controls in Asia and Africa. Now, of course, this has had in the recent past uh, disastrous consequences, you know, like, for instance, uh, the economic crisis in Asia, in Southeast Asia in 1997, and of course, the economic crisis in Latin America in 1998. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, what happens is that, you know, when uh, you know, capital, uh, you know, is withdrawn very quickly from one particular country, you know, I mean, it actually uh, puts pressure on uh, the concerned economy as well as its currency, 
And so its currency actually uh, can collapse and uh, it has a domino effect in the sense that uh, if one currency collapses, you know, I mean, another neighboring country's uh, currency also can collapse. This is precisely what happened in Southeast Asia in 1997, you know, when actually uh, the currencies of uh, Philippines, Indonesia, um, Taiwan, etc., etc., actually came under heavy pressure and uh, they faced a, a terrible economic crisis. Now, I, I, I now finally come to the, the concluding part, that is the political culture, you know, I mean the political dimension. Now, an universal political culture has been created, uh, whereby, of course, you know, I mean, when uh, globalization started, there was a expectation that it would lead to greater democratization uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what has happened, actually, you know, that has not happened. On the other hand, what has, uh, what has taken place is that uh, a consumerist culture, a managerial culture, actually has taken over. And there is greater materialism, greater consumerism that we find in society and basic principles and values of human dignity and uh, human identity actually have taken a back seat. Then, of course, you know, another very dangerous uh, trend that has, uh, that has been noticed actually that, you know, globalization has not remained confined only to politics, economics and, and culture or society. In fact, uh, it has also led to, uh, you know, I mean, trans-border uh, or transnational uh, agents, activities of transnational agents like uh, terrorists, uh, uh, trans-border criminals, drug traffickers, uh, arms transfer, and so on and so forth. You know, because as I said, that borders have now become increasingly less relevant. And so therefore, these uh, criminals or criminal activities, for instance, are now much easier uh, to carry out. And so therefore, uh, this has led to increased human insecurity and challenges for security agencies. And uh, on the culture side, I have already mentioned that, you know, I mean, there is, uh, in fact, uh, there is taking place actually a, some kind of a, an Americanization or Westernization of cultures, particularly in the developing countries, Western food, Western dress, Western uh, products are becoming uh, more popular or have become more popular, which have actually replaced uh, and threatened uh, local indigenous culture. So therefore, I think, you know, we can, we can conclude, uh, at least following the, uh, the critics, that globalization has led to greater impoverishment of uh, the backward countries and the backward societies, and uh, it has benefited primarily more uh, developed countries. And uh, particularly, I conclude by referring to the, its impact in the health sector, that uh, health uh, issues, particularly treatment, actually have become a severe problem now. Medicines have become more expensive because they are controlled by Western uh, pharmaceutical companies. And uh, uh, healthcare actually, uh, state uh, healthcare has almost collapsed and uh, their, uh, its place has been taken by, by uh, private healthcare, which has become far more expensive, particularly for the poor. So we find that overall it has led to, at least so far as the critics are concerned, I am following their argument only, that globalization has been an unmitigated disaster for the poorer and the developing countries.